The online assessment is your first step in the software engineering interview process where the employers are actually going to start testing your coding ability. But what exactly are these assessments like? Over the last two years, I've done over 50 of these online assessments for a ton of different companies. And in this video, I'm going to be breaking down everything you can expect from that online assessment. There are three core online assessment platforms, Byport, CodeSignal, and HackerRank. And in this video, we'll be doing a deep dive into each one of these, what you can expect when you receive them, how they work, and any other ins and outs that you should know. Hey, if you don't know who I am, my name is Mark Bellino. Within 18 months of learning, to code. I did six software engineering internships at companies like Figma, Netflix, NASA, and Tinder. And on this channel, my goal is to help you land your dream software engineering job. So for starters, let's make sure we're on the same page and define what even is an online assessment in the first place. Software engineering interviews are pretty unique in this way compared to essentially any other industry because they send these online challenges to candidates before ever really kicking off the interview process. These are usually tests that a company will send you. It'll consist of some coding problems that you need to solve. And in the end, you'll be assessed based on how well you did. Although it's not public information, most companies tend to have some bar that they're looking for, which will vary by company, for what they consider a passing score on their given online assessment. So some of the most popular online assessments that you might run into include Code Signals, Hacker Ranks, Codility, CoderPad, and even Byport recently. But among these, the most popular ones that I've seen have been Byport, Hacker Rank, and Code Signal. So first, let's start by taking a look at the Byport assessment. Some of the most notable companies using the Byport assessment are Figma and Lyft. But interestingly enough, Byport even has their own job board where you can apply to companies that specifically use the Byport assessment. The entire goal of the Byport is to essentially mimic what a day in the life of a software engineer will look like. And this is pretty different than what a lot of the other online assessments actually look like, which we'll cover later in the video. And I think you'll quickly start to see why the Byport is my favorite assessment style. I've taken a Byport assessment twice and both times it's contained the same two core parts a 40 minute technical design exercise and a 70 minute coding implementation exercise. So the goal of the first part is to simulate a technical design sort of thinking exercise to see how would you collaborate with your team members on a technical problem if this was your actual job. You're told that you're a member of your team and one of your peers is actually working on a technical design document that you're now being invited to review. So that means that there are existing comments being left that you should answer. That also means that there are certain questions that are gonna remain ambiguous that you should sort of ask about. And at the end, you'll have this sort of 15 minute portion where three options will be presented to you about how can we go about solving this problem. And it'll be up to you to sort of brainstorm which one that you think is the best approach. It's important to remember that in this conclusion section, there isn't a single right answer. There are going to be pros and cons to each one of these approaches. And so instead of indexing on which one you think is more correct, the focus should instead be on making sure that you've mentioned all of the major design requirements that were mentioned in the document above. And also referencing the pros and cons of the option you picked and why why you chose those sort of set of pros and cons over say the other options. According to Byport themselves, strong conclusions will be well structured, easy to follow and demonstrate understanding of the impact of certain technical decisions. And similarly, weak conclusions will fail to reasonably convey their decisions or select an option. And this information is taken directly from Byport themselves. Another interesting thing I'd just like to flag here is that Byport actually encourages you to look up any of the things that might come up in this technical design document stage that you might not be familiar with and feel free to research those on your own. So the second part is that coding implementation exercise. It's usually related to the technical design portion beforehand and it'll typically be three levels of increasing difficulty problems. It won't be your traditional sort of leak code or algorithmic style problem. Instead, you'll have multiple files. You'll have some pre-existing code to work off of, um, and you won't be sort of starting from scratch, but you'll have existing classes that'll sort of piece together and bring you your end result. So let's say to really break this down, your first task might be something like assessing your ability to read and navigate the code base and uh, implement something that's pretty simple, like a simple component within a class or maybe a simple function, something that isn't overly difficult. The second task might look like something more specifically assessing your algorithms and data structures knowledge, or maybe your ability to interact with APIs and properly sort of format data. So the second task will get a level more complex than that, and it could look like it's an algorithmic problem that requires you to choose and implement the correct data structure and algorithm approach, or it might be something like implementing certain network requests and working with the data that's already provided to you and building APIs on top of it. And finally, the third task tends to be more ambiguous, but it's usually something related to implementing a more creative solution to what the first and second task might look like to really piece things together and give the Byport assessors a deeper understanding 
of what you know. Next up, we have the code signal, which was given to me by companies like Netflix and Tinder. So some of the more important parts about the code signal exam, the most notable one is that these are usually proctored, which means that most times you'll end up having your camera on. The other comparison of this with the byteboard is actually that these tend to do be some of that lead code or algorithmic style of type of problems you'll run into. There's this thing called the general code signal exam, which is usually what you'll get when you're invited to take a code signal. And this essentially means that it's a 70 minute test consisting of four questions. And the score that you receive on that actually acts as more of a universal score that you can send to multiple companies, which then request a code signal score from you. And now you might be asking, Mark, what do these four questions actually look like? The first two questions are typically a leak code easy. So if you're familiar with what the leak code platform is like, this is a ranking of the problem. So it's something that'll typically fall into the easy or sort of early medium kind of difficulty. The third question will often be a matrix or a sort some kind of string manipulation problem. That's a common trend that I've seen. I've sort of vetted this among some other students who've been taking code signals. So make it that way you will. And finally, the fourth question, I don't think follows a very strict pattern that I've identified, but it is usually a medium to hard difficulty problem. In terms of scoring, code signals previously used to range between 600 to 850 being your perfect score. But as of spring 2023, they actually sort of redid the grading structure. And now it goes from 200 all the way up to 600 being your perfect score. And I tried to find the old score that I actually sent to Tinder and Netflix, but for some reason on the code signal site, it's not actually showing up under my previous results, which is weird, but I don't know if they maybe cleared some of the old scoring problems, but I do know that code signals were something that I always struggled with. And I know that I've never cracked over 800, whereas some people have even gotten perfect scores on this thing. So rest assured, you don't need to go sort of 600 or even like 550 plus. I think um, a healthy cutoff, anything above 500, I bet is a great score. But I know that translating that back into the previous scoring system for Netflix and Tinder, I think for Tinder, I'd scored in the high 600s, which isn't even all that high to begin with. And then for Netflix, I'm pretty sure I scored in the low 700s, maybe a 715 or a 720, um, but I was still able to get through. And finally, you sometimes might get a company specific test, which isn't the general code signal exam, which in that case, you can actually send it to other companies. But if you do get a general code signal, then that score will be good for up to six months for you to send out to other companies before it sort of expires. Okay, next up we have the Hacker Inc, which to me was my first ever online assessment platform that I got familiar with. I know Amazon used this, Slack uses this, Salesforce uses this, um, and a ton of other companies use the Hacker Inc. I'd say the Hacker Rank doesn't have as much of a standard format. It could really vary both in terms of the time allocated to you and the number of questions and also the style of questions. But if I was to give you what you can most likely expect, if I was to go into a given hack rank, I'd bet the chances are it's usually something between 60 to 90 minutes long to solve one to two questions. Most times it's two questions and they're usually a leak code style algorithmic problem. That's not to say that hacker ranks don't support some more object oriented type of problems or something that's a little less leak code but this is just a general case. The hacker rank will provide you with a general ID, sort of like the code signal and these other programs will. And then you'll have a set of test cases that are going to be helpful for you to pass in order to get a high score. Sometimes you'll have certain test cases that are visible to you. So you can see sort of the more basic cases of what's going wrong, what the expected answer is and what your answer is. And then there'll also be some hidden test cases where you can actually see what answer you were supposed to get. And pro tip for these, a lot of people look over it, but for a lot of these hidden test cases, you're still able to see your print statements. And so one of the things that you can actually do is print the info field then you can essentially know which test case was this. So you can try to deduce what it is that that hidden test case is actually testing you for. Finally, HackerRank's testing philosophy is that 80% of candidates should be able to answer the first question and only closer to 20% of candidates should be able to answer the second question. That is to say they do sort of go for this easy to hard distribution, which then means that the folks who answer both questions are in a relatively good standing. Some other platforms that I felt like were worth mentioning were Codility. Codility is actually pretty similar to HackerRank. Uh, it's not proctored, just like HackerRank is in proctored and Byport is in proctored. CodeSignal is actually the only one that is. And it's used by some quant companies like Hudson River Training or HRT for short. Another one is the Coder Pad Assessment. This again bears a similar resemblance to HackerRank where it's your more typical ID test cases certain allocated time with a few leak code style questions. But one of the companies that I know have sent me a coder pad in the past was Twitch. The final bit of information I want to leave you with is don't get discouraged if you get a really good score on your online assessment, but you end up not moving forward with the company. What? You might be like, Mark, what the heck? What's the point of the online assessment in the first place then? 
And let me explain to you. Some companies like a quantitative trading firm called Citadel have a pretty unique approach to how they target these online assessments. What they'll do instead is they'll do something called an auto OA, where they'll automatically send everyone who applies to them the online assessment in return. And then they'll only really start conducting these resume screens after they've received your online assessment score. This means that they won't filter you out on the basis of just your resume, but they'll take a look at your profile holistically, including your online assessment score and your resume. So there are pros and cons to this, like all things. The pro is that someone who might not have the most competitive resume won't get immediately filtered out and will actually have an opportunity to sort of highlight their coding ability in light of their resume. The con here though, is that if your resume just really doesn't meet the bar that they're looking for, it doesn't matter what you do on the online assessment. You could spend two hours, get the most perfect score they've ever seen, and you will still get resume rejected, which is super disheartening because if you get an online assessment, you spend your time on it, you get a perfect score and you got rejected anyway. Well, it's like, what else could you have done? And a final bit of closing thought that I want to leave you with is that most of these online assessments, the companies will actually just be looking at the score and won't be testing your code based on readability. Don't spend too much time trying to refactor your code, leave comments, Honestly, in these, you're really trying to go for optimizing for time and meeting those test cases. So don't get too caught up in those things. That said, there are slight caveats to this. I've had online assessments for Jane Street in the past where they've explicitly told me that they're going to be reviewing the assessments on the basis of readability. They're assigning Jane Street engineers to review these online assessments. And in my case, that's usually been told to me. So if you haven't been told anything and you just received a generic email invite to take an online assessment, chances are that you're good to not focus on readability and code structure and instead focus on the correct solution. And if you're watching this video and you're still sort of struggling with some of these online assessments or you're actually feeling a little nervous about them, then the best way to prepare for these is actually going down the rabbit hole of studying for these leak code style algorithmic problems. Most of these online assessments are just layers on top of these leak code style algorithm problems. And so if you're interested in my exact study plan for how I got good at leak code, then check out this video here. I'll see you in the next one.